Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures, the innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation? What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby sees Red with Edgar Snow, believed to be the first Western journalist to interview Chinese Communist leader Mao Zedong. This episode was filmed in 2012 in conjunction with the Lyric Opera's performance of Nixon in China at the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts. Hello, Ma. I don't I just said, hello, I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> You'll be happy to know this will be in English. Come back with me now to the 1920s and 30s. China, the world's largest country, a failed revolution in 1912, uh, the Western-oriented Democrat Sun Yat-sen, not producing real democracy, not attaining real power, civil war, communists versus nationalists, the Japanese taking much of Manchuria, threatening North China, the Soviet Union with troops on the border and influence in the Communist Party inside. And into this mix comes the young, soulful, Emersonian idealist. He's the Marco Polo of the 20th century and a Kansas City boy. Ladies and gentlemen, Edgar Snow. <laughs> Mr. Snow. Mm. 1936 a key year in world history. Hitler takes the Rhineland, Mussolini's uh, invading uh, Abyssinia, the Japanese are in Manchuria, Chiang is fighting the communists, warlords everywhere in China, and you have the audacity to go and find this mythical figure, Mao Zedong, who has taken his Chinese Communist Party army 6,000 miles on the long march to the caves of Yunnan. How did that happen? It was partly due to having met Madame Sun Yat-sen, or Jingling, or Susie as she was called. She studied over here in the United States. And I owed much of my sense of Chinese history, the Chinese people, the Chinese struggle, through her. And she had stayed in contact with a number of what, by the Kuomintang, that, and that's the nationalist party under Chiang Kai-shek, and they're controlling essentially most of the country, or trying to. She was more interested in what the revolution could bring. She was very disillusioned with Chang's regime. And uh, she had gotten feelers through various amazing channels that Mao and some of the communist leaders were interested in having a Western journalist tell their story to the world. And she knew that I was sympathetic to the Chinese cause, that I was anti-imperialist. And she thought, um, I might be interested. I immediately was. And, and no one knew where they, where no, they were. They, they, not they, really. They'd been, they'd been chased for 6,000 miles mm -hmm. by, by Chang's troops. They were up in the, the, the northwestern mm -hmm. western border. Uh, it wasn't safe to go there. And you had to take a train down to Yunnan. And then we went by horseback, mule, and finally foot up to Baoan, which was a little uh, village in the midst of all these mountains. The first person I really met of any authority out there was a little bearded man who came out of a hut about 15 miles outside of Bawan, and it was Zhou Enlai. And he greeted me very politely and in English, much to my astonishment. I had a little Chinese at this point. I'd been studying at the university, but I didn't have anywhere near enough to be able to carry on a thorough conversation, so I was very dependent upon my translator. And as we approached Bawan, People were out on the edges of the cliffs, and there was singing, and there was instrument playing, and I felt as if the brass band had been sent out to welcome this little man from Kansas City. And I had been led to believe by some that these people were monsters. And instead, of course, I was greeted with great kindness and, and, and great help, and I was given an enormous amount of time with Mao, four months. What was Mao like? Was he, was he I a used the word Lincoln-esque, which may give the wrong impression. He was a peasant originally. 
and largely self-educated. And Mao had a kind of peasant stolidity to him. Now, back in 1936, he was very slender. His head, very long hair. He was completely unpretentious, and he made no attempt to look like anything. He looked like one of his own foot soldiers. There, there's a famous picture of him that was uh, taken uh, by you, I believe, with, with the hat. Your hat. But he didn't have one of his own. And I had been given one of the communist caps, and I gave it to him, and he wore it in the photograph. But completely unpretentious. I remember once, the, the dwellings were all in caves. It was a very soft stone, and they had been able to dig out these caves, which had been done for hundreds of years. But the, the Red Army was able to expand that. And it was quite hot. Body lice was a terrible problem. And Mao began, while we were talking, to unceremoniously roll down his trousers and look for life down there. Uh, which he then proceeded to throw away and, and chat with me. And another time, we were looking at maps, it was boiling hot, and he proceeded to take off his trousers, again, without any kind of embarrassment whatsoever, and made comments about the map and where things had been and corrected where uh, notes I was taking, uh, and then put his trousers back on again as if nothing at all in the world. Did you see any of the uh, Soviet advisors? Or? They kept a rather low profile. Mao was determined to separate his communism from Russia. He said, we are communists, but we are not Muscovite. And this was not taken with great affection by the Russian advisors. Mao was determined to maintain his own Chinese uh, authenticity that way. What I want to know now is I want to know where does this foreign correspondent who's willing to go to be the Marco Polo of the 20th century and go up to the case of Yunnan, where does this boy come from in Kansas City. 3928 Charlotte Street, and the house is still standing. We were part of the St. James Parish. My mother was a devout Catholic, and my father, J. Edgar Snow, owned a little print shop down over here on 11th and Cherry. He was an idealist and a bit of an agnostic. And he talk, talk about what led you to want to get out of Kansas City and become <laughs> this world traveler. Well, um, perhaps it was seeing the Pacific Ocean for the first time, which happened almost by accident when I was only 14 years old. A friend of mine, Bob Long, had a 1917 a Model T. And Charlie White who was another friend of mine. And I, we'd made some money helping with the harvest in Kansas. And without telling our parents, we went out on the, well, the Santa Fe Trail, essentially, to Santa Monica. It took about two weeks. And uh, minute, God only knows what our parents, parents thought. No, did not tell our parents. Uh, we made it to California with a number of crazy adventures along the way. And then Bob's parents uh, met him there, took the car, and said, bye-bye, boys. And uh, Charlie and I were left to, to make it so back you, on the rails. you and Charlie, two 14-year-old boys, are left there in California. Yeah, yeah. OK. So That's what did neglect. you do? Uh, we rolled the rails back illegally, because we didn't have any money. And uh, we rode the cow catcher sometimes. We got arrested a couple of times, which was nice, because then we got free food. And uh, that we, we finally meal. made it all the way back to Kansas City for, for the hiding we so richly deserve. So, so that's what gave you the itch to travel. You, it did. You'd, see, you'd seen the world. You'd survived this great adventure. You, you go off to, uh, to, to college, and you go to the University of Missouri. Uh, the University of Missouri had a, a thriving and still a famous journal, school of journalism. So I went there for a while and worked under the, the direction of uh, Walter Williams, who then was the dean of the School of Journalism at that time. And he Eventually became the president of the university. That's right. But I was not what you'd call the ideal academic. And I only stayed for a year and never took a degree. And I felt that you know, the learning I wanted to do, I was going to do on my own feet. Uh, Williams had suggested that I, I go east. And I thought that was a wonderful idea. And I uh, took the SS Radner uh, as a, a deckhand out through the Panama Canal and to Hawaii, where the, the ship essentially collapsed. And I was stuck there for a couple of months with a friend, Joe Allison. And we sold pineapples and did various crazy things. a pineapple things. stand. Yeah, in, in Hawaii. I right. mean, talk about coals to Newcastle. Right. And you wrote your first, your first little, piece, little, little piece. piece called Hula Land. <laughs> Hula, Hula Land, <laughs> about... about uh, and I had an awful purple style at that time. And it was all about the palm trees and the romance of the East and all the rest of it. But uh, uh, I, I, the, the bit was between my teeth, and I wanted to go further. And uh, I, uh, I didn't have enough money to make it uh, on board a Japanese steamer going up to Japan. And uh, I, I snuck on board with a friend and stayed in his, his, uh, um, his cabin, uh, living essentially this on his a, breakfast. This is, a, this is a classic, a stowaway. You, a you stowaway. started your career as a stowaway. I did. We paid off the, the cabin boy, and I lived on ham and eggs for the week it took to get up to Japan. And then, but you and, end uh, up in China. But you we finally got in, to China, to Shanghai. Shanghai. You're staying at the YMCA. The YMCA. Where in, else? Now, 
I, I have to tell you, some years later, uh, when, I, when I was uh, teaching English in China and was, was on my way out, I stayed in the YMCA in oh. Shanghai. Yeah, and I met some of the grandchildren of the rats that you had met at the YMCA uh, in China. They were, they were there. Well, I had a letter from Williams to J.B. Powell, who at that time was running the Chinese Weekly Review. And, he and there's the a great connection, uh, J.B. Powell. Because he was a graduate of uh, the School of Journalism. As almost every correspondent was. in the Far East, Far East was. They were called the Missouri Mafia. And or the cowboy uh, correspondents. In fact, the Chinese Weekly Review. The Review-ing. prized pumpkins of Missouri, they were right, called. Right, right. The yeah. corn cobbers. <laughs> I could go on. It was founded by also a graduate of the University of Missouri, uh, Thomas Millard. What was exciting was that both those men, Millard and, and Powell, were um, anti-imperialist, and they were interested in seeing uh, a social change. They weren't interested in communism. They were both fairly conservative, as was I at that point. I mean, consider, I, I'd grown up here, and I didn't know anything about communism. I mean, it was a very conservative world that I'd grown up in Kansas City in the, in the 20s. And these men um, really started to open my eyes towards the social inequity that was rampant, particularly in Shanghai. Now remember, Shanghai at this point was largely divided up into sectors. There was the British and the American, and there was the French, international and there was settlements, Russian. which were governed completely separately from yes, the rest of, of, of Shanghai Yes, because of long-standing treaties had been made way back in the 19th century. And then you had the, the Chinese who actually lived outside of that circle. And so it was very difficult to get this sort of uh, country club crowd well, of internationalists to associate with the Chinese. Well, and, and Shanghai was a very corrupt, open city. There was gambling, oh, prostitution, massive prostitution, uh, incredible alcohol consumption, yep. drugs, black market rigged everywhere. elections, black market. Coming from Pendergast, Kansas City, you should have felt right at home. <laughs> The person who introduced you to the, uh, the side of China that, that ultimately led to you uh, going to the caves of Yunnan was Madame so Sun Yat-sen exactly. uh, Qingling, who you mentioned before. She really uh, introduced me to some of the intellectuals of China. She even encouraged me to publish a book dealing with uh, contemporary writers of China with translation and so forth, which I did, which didn't sell particularly well in the United Living States. China, yeah. But it opened my eyes to thought of, uh, that was contemporary at that time in China, which was, which was fascinating. Well, you, you wrote your first Im important piece for H.L. Mencken's American Mercury about, uh, about Mad Madame Sun. And this led to a, a career in which you were working for the Herald Tribune, the Saturday mm -hmm. Evening Post, the Chicago Daily News, Foreign Affairs, the Daily, London Daily Herald, the paper of the... the largely British a freelance existence, exactly, and none of it provide, providing much money. But this is right in the middle of the fight between the, the, the Guomindang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, uh, the communists, and the various warlords who are playing a, a, a part in the middle, and a, a huge famine uh, arises in Up China. In, in Manchuria in particular. And so I was sent out, you know, go by representatives of the government, write something encouraging for tourists to come. I mean, they wanted money, of course, to come into the country. And consequently, seeing the most unbelievable poverty, poverty that I, could, I couldn't even imagine before. Literally, it was a kind of feudal society in which the little petty warlords were still maintaining their fiefdoms. And, and in this, this famine, the Great Famine in, in, mm. in Northeast China, over three million People die. Mm -hmm. uh, their their as far as we bodies know, dumped more. in the city moat. Their 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 corpses in the river. Their entirely deserted villages. In the meantime, the warlords are planting poppies in <clears throat> what are otherwise fertile fields that would have opium. would would have would have produced grains that could have fed the people. And you, and you write about this and become become known as someone who's on the side of the Chinese people. And we should talk a, a little bit more about y you, your relationship with Mao and Red Star over China. Y you, you said uh, yourself about it that uh, you could think of the, the whole history of the communist movement and especially what you write about in Red Star over China as a huge grand propaganda tour. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were there for more than that. What were, what were they like in, when you went to the caves of Yunnan? Were they I was ideal? expecting depression, anxiety. They were very fearful because, remember, the further north they got, the closer they were to Manchuria, where the Japanese were. So not only were they worried about the Kuomintang, but they were also concerned about having to face the Japanese, which ultimately became uh, the unifying force for China. They were happy, or they seemed to be. No, I'm convinced they were happy, because when you did see people who were miserable, it was very obvious, the difference. They sang constantly. Obviously, this was training, too. This was how you passed along aphorisms and ideas and theories that Mao was inculcating. But also the act of, of singing, that alone was just a way of creating unity for themselves. Although they had very little food, 
Uh, there was usually millet. There wasn't much rice. A very small amount of meat that they could get. Uh, remember, as they went along and liberated these peoples, they also were driving out the warlords. And the warlords would go back east and to, to Shanghai and Hong Kong and so forth and say, mad, crazy people are killing everyone. Thousands are dying. Well, if they were killing thousands, they also seemed to resurrect a lot of them because they were then following Mao and trying to support him as best they could. But you didn't feel that you were maybe being manipulated a little bit by Mao? In, of course. In, 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 in I knew stories. that's why I was there. I had to make that adjustment for myself. Also, everything that I wrote, that I took from him, um, uh, was translated for me. I wrote in English. Then it was translated back into Chinese, handed back to Mao. Mao made notes. And then it was handed back to me again in translation. And although I was a journalist, I was trying to make people see the story of these incredible human beings who took this risk. And even if there was romanticization and exaggeration and uh, poetic license taken by the teller of the tale, the truth of the journey was unquestioned. You get back to, uh, to Beijing and, and, uh, and you begin to write and, and get a contract for Red Star and it becomes the number one bestseller in England. In England. Uh, 100, over 100,000 copies sold in England, which is extraordinary. A bestseller, not quite that, that large in, in, the, the, United in the United States. Uh, it's printed in, in, in China. But it also uh, gives you entree to virtually every corner of the world because you become the great foreign correspondent. And so you go off on your, on your journey and meet some other great men, Gandhi, for mm -hmm. instance, and, and Nehru. Nehru. And of course, their great concern was how to free themselves from English domination. I kept thinking, shouldn't they just sort of keep the status quo in order to fight, resist Japan? Because if they go into liberation, there may be chaos and pandemonium, and they won't be able to defend themselves from the Japanese. And, and Gandhi had said, no, 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 we must use everything we can to separate ourselves from, from the British. And the fact that he was able to, through passive resistance, cause a transformation in this huge body of people. You, you, you left China, mm -hmm. went back to the US for a while, talked to FDR, you become a war correspondent in Russia, you, at the and end cigarettes. of the war you, you see the liberation of the camps and, mm -hmm. and the, the, yeah. the horrible things. It's interesting to me that during the, the origins of the Cold War from 1939 to 1941, one of your few arguments with Mao in your last interview before uh, you left China uh, the Hitler-Stalin pact had happened, and Mao thinks this is a good thing. He tended to justify anything that was going to create more revolution without fully understanding the consequences sometimes. He, I mean, but after all, he was in China dealing with his own extremely complicated political situation. And so the ramifications of what were happening in Germany, I think, escaped him as a sense of, oh, good, people are coming together to struggle. Something good will come out of it, as opposed to merely destruction coming out of it. My point about this is you preserved your independence. Even though you were perceived as a promoter of Chinese communism and of Mao, you preserved your independence. You refused to go along with the American right Congress when uh, during this 39 to 41 period uh, they were signing anti-war manifestos, didn't mm -hmm. want the United States to get involved in the Second World War as long as the Hitler-Stalin pact was going on. And so when the anti-communist period, the Cold War period starts and there are the HUAC hearings, the McCarthy hearings, you're never, you're never called. Although the most Red Star was mentioned many times at those committee meetings and it's interesting that I wasn't. But you mentioned the, the Communist Party and the Communist Party in the United States and I was so frustrated because they weren't thinking for themselves. They were always taking directives from the higher forces from, uh, from the Kremlin. And I thought, are they ever going to realize that they're sitting on a branch and that the, the Russians are literally sawing the branch off for them and they don't seem to see that, that they're, they're cutting their noses off to, to spite their own faces? Come to the 50s, you write uh, A Journey to the Beginning, your, your, your wonderful Autobahn. biography, yeah. and move to, move to Switzerland. But during this entire period, you're trying to get back to China. China. It's hard. You can't get a visa into Russia. You can't, you can't get a visa to China. Some of that's our State Department, but some of the Chinese, Chinese. the Chinese are not interested in having you. Which right. Is, the Cultural which Revolution is, really put the kibosh on anybody who wasn't immediately within their ideological purview. If you hadn't been vetted by what was then considered the the, the judges of the Cultural Revolution, and not thus I was even out on the outs because but many you, of the people. You from do finally, early in, days, in 1960 and in 1964 64. and then in 1970, you finally come back to China and meet, in each case, you meet with Mao and discuss these things. The first time is right after the Great Leap Forward. Right. 
in which we now know perhaps as many as 45 million people, people died, died in, the, in the created starvation. Or the Great Leap Forward was a mad attempt to force agrarian reform on peoples who were not educated enough, were not industrialized enough, to be able to make these adjustments. And that, combined with famine and political unrest, created this appalling situation, which was then covered up. And, and they took you through, and it's essentially a Potemkin village. They, you, it looked fine, but in fact, we now know that was the worst destruction in the Great Leap Forward. And Mao eventually know. admitted that it had been a mistake. But there was something somewhat inhuman in the way he, he said that. And it wasn't a sense of guilt or horror that he had killed, that all these people had died very probably unnecessarily if more time and care had been taken. There was just a sense of, oh, well, it was a mistake. We'll move on. Now, maybe if you're an autocratic leader, that's how you have to think, but it was somehow chilling. And to me, that was, I could see a difference in his, who he was from where he had been in 1936. And in, in, in 1964, you go, which is right before the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, you're talking about the Long March and, and your interviews in the 30s, and, and he says there are only 800 survivors of that, and yeah. they're running the country in a people's democratic dictatorship, and you had had a little bit of a skeptical view of what a people's democratic dictatorship might look like with these 800 people. <laughs> with only 800 people. And that was where he was getting the idea that the whole generation had grown up and had not known what it was to have been on the long march, to have struggled against the Kuomintang, to have experienced liberation. And that, that's where I think the seeds of this cultural revolution began to take shape and thought that he had to completely uh, revamp um, the, the dead weight as he saw it at the time. And in the process, he annihilated so much that, that was good within the Chinese culture, but in the, for the sake of revolution. And revolution was a kind of a holy word for Mao. Your world historical role, your great role, the two scoops of world history, come to fruition in, in 1970, just as you're beginning to finally become very skeptical mm -hmm of the results of the Chinese Revolution, and you get, you're living in Switzerland, you're not terribly well. And it's been and very hard to get anything published anymore. I was, although not formally um, reprimanded on before the committees, uh, I, I had, had to leave the Saudi Evening Post. They considered me far too left, and it was very difficult to uh, make a living as a writer. I was teaching history in Switzerland, and uh, I had two children at this point, and my wife was an actress, and she was unable to get work because of blacklisting. And I had written in 1969 to Mao, urging, you know, I'd like to get over there, I want to see what's happening. And I had made a film, a documentary about, about China, it hadn't succeeded, it lost a lot of money on it. And finally he said, yes, come. And at that time, that was when the, the Mao cult really hit me in the face, and I could see how things were everywhere you, you went. You challenged him oh, on, the, on the cult, the pictures everywhere. everywhere the pictures, the, the only the broadcast, the, the little red, little red, the book. Little red book. Everywhere his sayings were being constantly pounded, 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 pounded. And I said, you know, you used to make jokes about the, the cult of the leader, the Maoist cult. And uh, he said, well, you know, Khrushchev didn't survive, probably because he didn't have a cult. Ho, ho, ho. But he also was trying to send a message to Richard Nixon yes. and Henry Kissinger. He said, you know, the Vietnam War is going on. And he said, you know, I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want to fight you. You notice I haven't invaded Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> Which, now, he certainly seemed to be hoping to keep them out of Cambodia and northern and Vietnam and felt that the uh, Americans would eventually run out of steam and that uh, the war would fail and that the Vietnamese would take over one, one way or the other. And so he was interested in actually establishing communication with Nixon, to my great surprise, because of course Nixon was, uh, had been for a long time a notorious anti-communist uh, spokesman. And I said to him, why Nixon? And he said, because I know where he stands. I like people who are on the far right. I know where they are. But I did not want to deal with Truman and Johnson the Democrats, where are they? So when I did publish my letter in 71 about Mao and it made it quite clear that he had said to me, well, we think President Nixon should get on a plane and fly over here and see us. And uh, that made very obvious and that this was a follow-up and he was able to build on that and say, ah, well, maybe I will go. And, and so the wheels of diplomacy worked very slowly, but of course, eventually he did. And there was talk about my going and unfortunately, I had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer uh, the December of 1971. And of course, he came to China in February of 1972, and I died the 15th of February. And 
The irony, of course, was that I, who felt that I had tried to open the gate for the West to understand the East, and now, after all these years of isolationism from the United States and misunderstanding, ignoring 700 million people, and now this bizarre Republican president whom I didn't like is finally coming over here to open the door on his side. And I was no longer part of the scene. With the kindness and support, and this moves me so much, of my Chinese friends. Uh, I was very ill and in, in Switzerland, and there'd been talk about getting me to the United States. Um, but no one offered to help. We didn't have enough money to do it. And the Chinese sent an entire delegation of physicians led by a good friend of mine, George Hatem, and Huang Hua, who was a primary uh, ambassador at that time. And they stayed with me, essentially creating a hospice situation for me all the way through. But the rich irony that the Chinese came to me while Nixon was coming to China, I find that astonishing. And, and at the end, what is your legacy? You believed very strongly in the importance of what you referred to in your eulogy of Gandhi as the inner truth, uh, the moral influence of great souls. The truth of Edgar Snow is he was our greatest foreign correspondent and a boy from Kansas City who was always seeking the truth. Ladies and gentlemen, Edgar Snow. He wanted to see um, justice done. He wanted to see all these billions of starving people without a voice make a change in the world. He then saw that as he aged uh, between the West and the East, that they were fighting over ideology and they weren't, that there was still humanity and that the human connection was not being made. And he hoped to be able to make that with his writing. And when it was denied him, by uh, political concerns. I think that was the great tragedy of his life and broke his heart in many ways. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri and by these fine organizations. Mm -hmm.